Hi, I'm George Nordhaus. Welcome to Monday Morning. What you don't know about your agency carrier agreements. Holy goodness, because that is so important and it's something that I hadn't thought very much of over these years. And then I saw what Judy Newman was doing on this and, uh, I, well, it'll, this will be explained to you in just a second. She's the presenter and uh, I'll tell you about Judy. Let me show you just a second. Here's Judy's picture coming up and she and I worked together for a lot of years. She was a consultant, still is a consultant with the agencies. She's been something like 500 agencies over her period of time going in there for everything from business perpetuation and sales and marketing and so forth. She's uh, been on convention programs with me and we've had a lot of good, but now she's got a, something called NetGen Data Security Consulting. Explain it, Judy, will you please? Hey, George, thanks. NetGen Data Security Consulting is a, uh, a an idea that came about because of all of this stuff about big companies getting hacked and what they're doing and we never hear what happens to the smaller people. And because of the topic, insurance carrier company agreements, we found that insurance agents probably don't understand exactly what they're signing up for when they sign those company agreements. Well, I never really thought they did. Uh, I guess you're right. They just want to get it, get it done, huh? And so what? They just want to get it done. You know why? Because if they've been waiting for this company to come in an appointment, that means they want to put business with them so they can take it away from the competition. Well, I can tell you that's not going to happen after they hear this one <laughs> anymore. Exactly. I can tell you that. Yeah, that's a good exactly. thing to do. Okay, well, let's go exactly. ahead. Exactly. You got it. So I start with how much money do you have in your wallet? Because if you haven't been reading your company agreements, and those include ENS and wholesalers and so on and so forth, but uh, you could be putting um, not only the money in your wallet at risk, all of your assets. Oh, well, I never thought of it that way, but I guess you're really right. It's, uh, um, yeah, and, and, and because of the language in the carrier agreements, which we'll get into a little bit more, um, not only is it going to drain your pocketbook, but your agency could be gone before you know it. And for most agents, George, that we talk to, the agency is one of their biggest assets and what, uh, what they depend on for future retirement. So we just want to make sure that they know that they could be at risk. Good. So let's start with, can your agency weather a data breach? Well, um, if uh, the compliance parts of uh, the laws, federal and state laws, are not being adhered to, probably not. Um, but in small businesses, we find that 84% uh, of data breaches occur in businesses with a thousand or fewer documents. Now, a small agency, um, and I'm going to say an agency, even with 15 or fewer employees is going to have more than a thousand records oh my goodness. because it not only it not only includes the current active accounts, but you got prospects in there. You got you've got um, uh, fi files on old customers canceled or just went someplace else. So it's not it's not hard to have more than a uh, thousand records, which puts you at greater risk. And 82% of breaches happen to companies with less than 100 employees. And a lot of that, George, is because when companies get larger, even you know over 50 employees, but over 100 employees, typically they're going to have an IT department and not somebody that's right. dealing mm -hmm. with all of this stuff. And 80% of small businesses wow. that get breached Ooh, don't recover. That's don't scary. Recover. That scares me. I had no idea it was that bad. Uh, let me ask this before you go. For, do, do agencies sometimes have, no, we're talking about agency customers here primarily, but do agencies have some data uh, breaches occasionally? Um, yes. Um, it's a very closely guarded secret. It's about as closely guarded secret as how many agencies file E&O claims. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Which, yeah. which, which we don't, which we don't know. Nobody advertises. Nobody talks about it because they don't want to encourage people um, to read it in the news and say, "Oh, guess what? <laughs> I think I'll file an E&O claim." You know, where's right. the deep pockets these yeah. days? Right. But 80% of the breach businesses that fail to recover typically do not have any kind of a plan in place if something happens. Wow. They're not in compliance, and typically they won't have any cyber liability insurance which we keep talking about this and everybody keeps saying, you know, why why aren't more people buying it? Why aren't more people selling it? That's a whole other topic. Right. 
but let's say um, when looking at your agency agreements, they may say deed of breach, okay? But the indemnification clause, and there is one in every, well, we reviewed over 100 um, agency contracts, and every one of them had an indemnification clause. Mm -hmm. And what it says, basically, and I'm not going to read it specifically, but it, it refers to any claim, demand, um, liability dispute, damage cost, and expense or loss, and attorney's fees. And what that means is if the agent causes a data breach that affects the company that they are totally um, responsible for all of the expenses. And we'll get into that a little more when we talk about what does insurance cover. Okay. It doesn't cover any of these things. All right. So we have our agents and brokers, all right, um, the indemnification wording. So what does it really say? Well, I'm going to just paraphrase it. I'm going to leave it up there for a minute so everybody can read it. Yeah. But it says that any breach of the terms of this agency agreement or unauthorized illegal act is a violation of the law. And it says that the agent who has control of records, if their breach it causes a breach to the company, they um, and NPI or what we refer to as non-public personal information, um, will result in the things I just talked about on the previous slide. So that's when we say, how much money do you have in your wallet? How deep are those pockets? Yeah, good point. And is that really where you want to be spending it? <laughs> scary. It is scary. So let's talk about um, what the agency agreements specifically mention. All right. They specifically mention uh, GLB or Graham Leach Bliley. Um, and in that regard, it's like you read the agreement, it's in there. You better know what that law says because you need to be in compliance with it. Got it. Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, a lot of us, we know what that is, but that came into play um, when involving insurance agencies when they started running um, clue reports or credit reports on people for um, getting auto insurance or home insurance. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and then the, and then FACTA was the follow-up law to the uh, FCRA, um, and that's a little bit where that um, red flag rules has come into. But these three these three laws right here are specifically um, handled under the Fair Trade Commission. So it's FTC that comes after you um, if you're in violation of any of these laws. They, actually, FTC does a whole lot more than I thought it did, but for <laughs> purposes of this presentation, right. these are the guys that come after you. <laughs> and then we have the HIPAA, HIPAA, and then we have a high tech, and those are under the guidance of uh, Health and Human Services, specifically OCR, which is the Office of, I can't remember. <laughs> no, it's all right. It doesn't make any difference, but yeah, the HIPAA thing, boy, when it came out, people were panicked all of a sudden, and God, you go to a doctor now or anything, and you've got to sign everything in sight. I know, I know it's, a, it's well, real you know, different. Though, yeah, you know, though, when it comes to that, yeah. when it first came out and they were all getting in compliance, yep. they you sign in and then they cross your name off so nobody else can read it, right? Uh -huh. And they would call you by your first name and not your last name. So I go to the doctor and they go, Miss Newman, you're next. <laughs> so much for HIPAA. So much for HIPAA. I, That's I'd, almost like to be, I'd almost like to be a whistleblower and say, you know what, I think I'll just call HHS and OCR stands for Office of Civil Rights. I have no idea why they oversee this, but they do. Well, I've anyway. always heard of Graham, the, of the, uh, what is it, the Graham, uh, Graham Leach Biley. Tell me about uh -huh. that. I've, I've heard about it, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Well, when it first came out, it, right. it said who it, it um, applied to, and there was this clause that said financial institutions. And so insurance companies and insurance agencies are going, <laughs> we don't need to do anything about that, until they expanded the definition of financial institutions to include insurance companies and insurance agents. What, what, how do they say it? I want to see what they say it here on the, on the screen if you do. Uh, the, next, uh, the next screen here. There. That's what I want there to see. It's, it's a robust law and it basically requires the covered agency, which is the financial institution in, in what we're talking about with insurance agencies, right. to notify customers of how their non-public private information is going to be um, secured. Okay. okay. How are they going to protect it? Got it. And 
one of the things they did in that law is said that you must provide a privacy notice. And I don't know, George, if you remember back, oh my gosh, 15 plus years ago, you'd get a bank statement or a credit card statement, there would be this little notice in there um, saying that uh, is a privacy notice uh -huh. and your information was being protected. And then all of a sudden, those notices disappeared. And that's because there was an addendum to the law that said if you posted it on your website, it was as good as making that annual um, mailing. Got it. And it's very few insurance agencies ever did annual mailings um, when it came out that you could post it on the website. Of course, the state associations, PIA and uh, Big I, mm -hmm. um, gave samples of what this privacy notice could look like. And if you go in and you look at insurance agencies' privacy notice or privacy statement, you'll see that they're pretty much cookie cutter, all right? Now, what I always wondered is how many people read that privacy notice before they posted it on their website. <laughs> okay, so the privacy notice was originally intended to be mailed. Around 2004, you could add it to the website. And my question is, what does your notice say? Since they're pretty much cookie cutter, all right, it talks about how you're protecting non-public private information, personal information. And what it says in there is that you have to secure the data and you have to follow guidelines. And when we talk about securing data, we're talking about how do you put it in a format that no one else can read it unless they have a password. Mm -hmm. um, Breach of contract in these agency agreements says that if you are not in compliance with GLB, which is the agency agreement, everybody pull out an agency agreement and read it. If you're not in compliance with GLB and what other um, federal and state laws may be specifically defined or just general, state and federal, um, you are in breach contract. Which means, basically, if you're in breach of contract, a lot of times you lose the contract, right? I guess so. You know, I don't, I don't remember seeing these on agency websites. I've just, you know, this is something I'm not involved with, and we do a lot of agency websites, but our our technical people do that. I didn't know, I didn't know that was on there. I guess they are, but go ahead. I believe you. Oh, you have you have one on your website too. <laughs> do I? Oh gosh, don't. Okay, yeah. I, I shouldn't have said that. I should know better okay. than that. Okay. The, the the main point of being in compliance with GLB or any of these other laws is encryption. Now, I have brought this subject up to a lot of agents as I go in, and and I'm doing audits and stuff, and they're like, we can't be bothered. If we sent encrypted email to our clients, they would get all you know what at us, and and um, so we can't do this encryption. Well, the law says you have to. <laughs> and I was talking to I was talking to somebody who specializes in cyber liability, and they said the biggest uh, downfall of any company is the failure to do encryption. So we put that at the top of the list. And agency management system like um, uh, TAM, um, they have uh, an arrangement with I think it was R Post or somebody, but there's other companies out there that can do encryption for you. And encryption is what's called the safe harbor. That is, if you are encrypting anything that has non-public personal information in it, you're safe from fines and penalties. Now, the EU, who really is much further ahead of the United States in all of this um, cyber liability and data protection and security, um, just recently voted to take encryption out of the safe harbor. In other words, you can be encrypted, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to get fined or penalized or something. And earlier this year, the state of Tennessee, in their data breach response laws, took out encryption as a safe harbor. I would expect to see, over the next couple of years, the rest of the states taking out encryption as a safe harbor. I'm glad. I don't even know what it is, so I want you to have you tell me in just a minute, but go ahead. What? Safe harbor? No. That's, I know what safe harbor is, but encryption. Yeah. Just go ahead, though. You're encryption doing well, encryption no, is that? Later. <laughs> okay. Ahead. All right. Security. Um, you need a security plan, including your policies and procedures. In other words, your policy statement, your privacy notice, says 
that you're going to protect data, and you've got a written security plan and procedures. So when we go in and we look at an agency, we see the privacy statement, and then we ask them, where are their written policies and procedures for their security plan? And they kind of, you know, they kind of look at us, you know, do the windmill in the eye thing, you know, like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, you posted it on your website that you got a security plan. Mm -hmm. What does that say? Uh-huh. Go ahead. Prevention and detection. <laughs> yeah, prevention and detection procedures. And what that really means is that there are companies out there that do what we call um, detection and um, penetration testing. And what that means is that they'll monitor your system 24-7, on and on and on, and if there is any indication, like a red light goes off that says somebody's trying to hack your system, and we find that there are very few agents that have prevention and penetration procedures, hmm. and the data breach response plan. That's required by um, law in 47 states. Wow. Um, business continuity plan, a little different, we'll get into exactly what that is, um, but it's different than a disaster recovery plan. So let's go into it a little bit more. Okay, yeah. encryption. All right, here Thanks. we go. Thanks. Uh, I always heard of it. I never knew what it was. <laughs> encryption is whenever non-public personal information is involved, it needs to be encrypted so that if I intercepted an email from you, mm -hmm. I can't read it unless I have the passcode. Okay, got it. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's it's what the spies used, you know, uh, the intelligence agencies <laughs> and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> spy stuff. And encryption needs to not only affect data in motion, goes back and forth like to you and me. All right, it also needs to handle data arrest, and that's data stored on your server or wherever you're storing your data. Now. People can say, well, we're using an online agency management system. Well, I can tell you right now, there's a server in the office that's storing other information. Okay, so mm -hmm. any data at rest also needs to be encrypted. So when you're saving stuff to your in-house server, it needs to be encrypted. Okay. And mobile devices. Oh, my gosh, we got, we got the iPads, the notebooks. We've got um, phones of every kind. We've got laptops. And what's the first thing? I don't know if you read anything about hacking. But oh, yeah, everything. Thing, <laughs> I can. What's the first thing is that somebody left their laptop in the airport. Brother. If it was encrypted, nobody panics. If mm -hmm. it's not encrypted, good heavens, everything goes crazy. Now, besides being encrypted, okay, if you've got any mobile devices, they can also be um, programmed to explode on command. And I don't mean blow up and pieces go everywhere, but totally wipe it out. I mean, really kill the hard drive and any information in it. Okay. But that's, that's encryption. Got it. All right, now your security plan. All right. Um, we need to assess um, what kind of a situation you have. Um, walking into an agency, and I did this just recently, and they said, um, oh, we're not online. Um, we store all our information on our in-house server. Well, I'm standing there right by the front door, and there's this door open to this room, and it says, don't close the door because the room will overheat. And guess what's in that room? I don't have to. The server. So how, so how long is it going to take somebody to come in and just pick up that server, especially when I asked if the stuff on the server was encrypted, and they looked at me like what is encryption? in another yeah. language. With my stupid so question. Yeah. <laughs> so we assess the, uh, the situation to see where exposures are, and that was just a simple one. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, there's just lots of things. Yeah. But a security team, you got to have somebody that heads up your security team. Now, we know in a small agency, you're not going to have somebody hired as a chief security officer, all right? right? But somebody needs to be in charge of working with um, professionals. In other words, you can outsource some of this stuff. Do uh, Let me ask you something and, right there. Excuse me a minute. Do, do some big agencies actually have somebody does this a full-time job? Oh, absolutely. Um, you can go to some of the larger agencies, yeah. and I know that you have some that you're in contact with, but oh, yeah. yeah, ask them. They've, they've got, I mean, some of them can have as many as eight to ten people that oh, do nothing but them. gosh, I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, exactly. And then you need the plan, 
okay? Um, what are the things you're going to do? Who's going to be involved? How often you're going to test it? You know, um, and over and over and over again, you just have to have that plan in place. And it's not enough to just take and download a sample security plan off of the internet and say, oh, we have a security plan. If you don't know how you're going to use it and who's involved, it doesn't do any good. On the security plan, which is, which is a requirement, and you said in your privacy statement that you're going to protect information, so you need to secure it. But in order for you to know if it's really working, you have to regularly audit it. There's always changes to software. There's changes to everything that's going on in the world of technology. So you can't just write it and put it in the drawer. And then you have to test it. Um, maybe some of that is that penetration testing I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you have to have a process to go in and test. Are people turning off their computer? Does it time out after somebody's not at their desk for a certain period of time, et cetera? Oh, boy. And then training. Everybody in the agency needs to have training. And some of the laws even require that this training should take place annually. Um, on the security policies and procedures, what they should be doing. Now, agents, I have to give them credit, years and years ago when we were only dealing with paper files, they would say, okay, we have to keep all this information confidential. We'll lock the filing cabinet when you leave the office. All right? Well, you don't have that <laughs> luxury anymore. All your information is, can be accessed if somebody wants to get to it. Now, just for, just for grins and giggles, I had a college student from a local university here um, hack into a couple agencies, and they were absolutely, incredibly shocked that Ooh. anybody could do that. Wow! And he and he did it within two or three minutes. <laughs> yeah, scary. So that's how we kind of get that. Yeah, that's how we kind of get their attention. Mm -hmm. So on the security plan, doing all of the assessment teams, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, mm -hmm. you do it all, over and over again each year. Wow. Make sure you're up with the latest. I had no idea all this. Okay. I'm learning. I'm learning. Keep going. <laughs> so one of, the other, one of the other things that's required is data breach response plan. Remember I said in the carrier agreements it says being in compliance with all federal and state right. regulations that, as it refers to privacy, etc. So 47 states have um, data breach response laws. And it tells you what you need to be doing, how much it's going to cost you if you're not in compliance, the fines and penalties, and so on and so forth. That's in 47 states. There are three states that don't have it, and that's Alabama, New Mexico, and South Dakota. Um, besides the 47 states, there's data response, uh, breach response plans uh, requirements in D.C., Guam, Puerto Rico, and the US, U.S. Virgin Islands. Massachusetts and California were the first states to do this. Mm -hmm. So if you read their data breach response uh, laws, everybody else kind of followed the same outline. Those are two, still two of the string, stringest. The, the, they are really tough laws to be in compliance with. So if you understand what those laws say, the rest of them pretty much follow suit. Well, you said, uh, you said uh, New Mexico. Of course, I'm in New Mexico and Santa Fe. We're the state capital, so I'm going to go down and see the governor as soon as it's over. There you go. Get it yeah, there's no data breach response law in New Mexico. Okay, I'll work on it. I'm yeah, my brother kidding. lives in New just, Mexico, too. Oh, so, does he? Yeah. I, I'm just kidding, though. I'm really kidding. Go ahead. Go forward. Okay, so in the data breach response plan, you have to have a response team. In other words, you get notification, and maybe you've been smart enough to hire you know, somebody that does penetration testing or watches your system 24-7, and the red light goes on, and they contact you and say, you need to go shut everything down, you know, put a bomb mm -hmm. on it or something. But... <laughs> You need your response team. Who's going to do what? All right. If you were smart enough to buy cyber liability insurance, you need to know how to submit the claim and put them on notice that you have you have reason to believe you've been breached. And this isn't something you want to wait on. All right. Um, this is something that if you have any inclination that there could be a claim, you want to do it very quickly. Okay. And your external resources. The next person that you call is an attorney somebody that specializes in data breach laws. Um, so, and then you have in your plan all your remediation measures. And some of those, I think people who, who have um, worked with somebody 
you know, a doctor or a hospital or whatever that supposedly had been breached, you get this letter that says, you know, if something happens to your credit cards or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. they give you this, um, it, like the life lock thing or whatever. So remediation measures, how are you going to take care of the breach? If you don't have insurance, it's very costly. For example, if you had 5,000 records that were breached, the average cost to get all the notifications and everything done is about $215 a record. Oh my gosh, that's 100,000 or something. I can't do it that fast. No, it's, uh, it's over a million. <laughs> over a million? <laughs> now it shows why I'm not rich. See, I can't. No. Right. Wow, right. I didn't so, have any idea of that. Yeah. And so, you know, 10,000 records, yeah, that's, you know, 20 million, so, you know. Yeah, I got it. All right. Okay. So anyway, the expense could be enormous. And just an aside, I've looked at agents that are buying cyber liability, and they're not buying enough coverage. That's just They're not buying enough coverage. Let's repeat that mm -hmm. a little louder, please. Because, yeah, it's not enough coverage because most of the policies that they're buying are um, what do we want to do? Scaled down. They're, they're not the same kind of policies that a target would buy. They're scaled down and attorney costs are included in the limited liability. They're not outside of the limit. Okay. So if you have a million dollars of coverage and you need to do all this stuff, send the notification, get a forensics expert in there, get the computer people in there to fix whatever's wrong and so on and so forth, and then you got legal fees on top of that, a million dollars isn't going to cover it. Won't be enough. Okay, go forward. Okay, so that's just the starting point on a data breach response plan. Now we'll talk about that other thing, and I like to refer to this as my four-legged stool: privacy plan, security plan, data breach response plan, and the business continuity plan. All right. And this stool is made up to have four legs, and if you only got three, what are you going to do? <laughs> You're uh -huh. going to fall over. Fall over, right? Right. So unlike a disaster recovery plan, the BCP covers a broader range of issues. Um, a disaster recovery plan, um, not everybody has them, not every agent has them. We know, um, I'm in Florida, so we know most of the agents here have one because, you know, they worry about hurricanes. Um, my guess is, is that, you know, back several years ago when Hurricane Sandy hit um, New York, New mm -hmm. Jersey, mm -hmm. They were less likely to have a disaster plan on what to do after a hurricane because they just didn't usually hit there. But in a business continuity plan, we're looking at what are the key business activities? What are the things that the agency does that, if interrupted, could put them out of business? Um, and identify the critical business functions, and that's being able to be in contact, one of them being able to be in contact with your clients all the time. You know, don't answer the phone, they go someplace else. You must determine your downtime. If you're breached, one of the things you need to do is you need to shut down your computers, right? So how long is that going to be shut down? How long are you not going to have access to any information? In a disaster recovery plan, all right, they say, okay, we'll set up a mobile home or a trailer, we'll bring in some other computers, and boom, you're on back online. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're breached, you can't go back online until you figure out where the breach came from and fix it. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen as often as, or as fast as people would like to think it does. Okay. And then, uh, and part of your BCP is how to maintain your business operations without um, jeopardizing any of your data that's been breached and making it more vulnerable. How are you going to continue your business operations? And um, lots of agencies know what they'll do in a disaster recovery plan. Like I said, they get the trailer, the, co uh, the, the uh, computers, and they're back up and running phones and whatever. Well, is that really um, how easy it would be in with a hack? Probably not. In fact, I can okay. guarantee it's not. Got it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when we, look at, when we look at what it says in the agency company agreements, and we look at what it says in state and federal laws when it comes to protecting non-public personal information, compliance is not an option, okay? It isn't something that everybody else has to do, but you don't. Mm -hmm. And insurance agents that are involved in sales and insurance collect non-public personal information, name, address, driver's license number, date of birth, social security number, and we can go on. 
So because they have this information, they are required to meet the compliance standards. Go ahead. So let's, let's look at our agency agreements and see what they say. Okay. It says in there, pay all costs of the investigation by the company for both the agency as well as the cost of national investigation since the breach originated at the agency level. Well, Whew, that sounds big to me. Sounds big to me, too. Well, and here's the thing, George. If the agency is breached and as a result a company is breached, which is where this whole thing comes into play, what's the likelihood at the agency level that it was just one company? that got breached. An insurance agency represents 20 companies. If they can get into the agency, they can get into all 20 companies. Oh, boy. It's big. Pay all costs of the required notifications by the company. Now, it may, the company may say, hey, they got into our system as a result of um, your agency, you know, screwing up, and um, now you might only had 5,000 records. We've got 5 million. God. All right. Okay? Yeah. And even on, even on most um, cyber liability policies, if there is third-party liability coverage, it's very limited. Pay all the costs of the attorney's fees and pay all defense and liability costs incurred by the company. We can be talking massive amounts of money in that little stack I showed on the first slide. I believe it. Wouldn't even begin to cover it. Cyber liability coverage without third party uh, is not going to cover any of it. So where do we go? Where do we go? Um, well, there's additional costs and we can go on about those. But yeah. these costs could likely run thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions of dollars. And most small agencies that I know of, George, don't have that kind of loose change hanging around. Most big agencies don't either. But go ahead. <laughs> there you go. All right. So what we recommend and suggest is carefully check all of your agency agreements. If you don't believe that I've looked at over 100 of them, including the addendums that are sent out by email that don't require a signature, um, one that pops to mind is when um, travelers sent out an addendum. Mm -hmm. um, when they uh, sign an agency up to access all of the files online, it specifically says in there what you're responsible for. And they didn't ask you to sign it. They just sent it and said, this is what we're going to enforce. Okay? <laughs> yeah, so much for that. Okay. Yeah. And, the only, and the only way that the agency can protect themselves is to become totally and verifiably compliant. And it's, in a small business, like the agencies that we're talking about. We're not talking about the ones that have big security teams and everything, but we're talking about, you know, our friends, 50 or 25 employees and under. Yep. You know, local agency, one, maybe two offices. Right. They need, they need to understand the four legs of compliance, and they need to focus on getting that in place. Like I said, there are still some. You can go to some websites and not see a privacy statement, but I'd say fewer than 20% of agencies with websites now don't have a privacy statement. This scares me, you know, and this is why that when you, when I heard about what you were doing here, I contacted you uh, and we talked or we contacted each other and why uh, uh, we we figured how can we get this in the hands of agencies more and more, how they're going to be, I mean, the complexity of all this, if I'm an agent, a small agent run, how the heck am I going to, I got enough problems dealing with tomorrow's payroll, much less all of this stuff. And so, uh, uh, at agencies online, we we went to you and said, "Let's give. What can we give the agents that will be helpful? Let me show you how to uh, uh, to access that. Let's let's see my. Uh, there we this go. Is, uh, agencies yeah, this online. Is, uh, yeah, this is agencies online uh, homepage. Agenciesonline.biz. But you see down there, it says announcing agencies online risk products. Hey, we just put that on today, as a matter of fact, and it's uh, because of. This, because I, I think this is going to shock a lot of agencies. What's it look like there? You, you explain it, will you please? Right. This is the um, risk products that NetGen has um, developed. Um, they are basically uh, templates for privacy notice policies and procedures, the business association compliance toolkit, which um, needs to be used by anybody that says group sells group health insurance because they are a business associate of the insurance company and they need to be in compliance with the HIPAA laws. 
And we have the data breach notification policies and procedures. And some of these templates are up to 7,500 pages because it goes through what you need to have. Um, here's a sample. Um, you can fill it in. Um, here's the, the training program. Here's your assessment. And all of these um, require assessment. So there's an assessment in there. Ask you questions. And as you start answering no, you start to realize some of the things that you need to do. Anyway, policies and procedures for what vendor agreements, all right, yep. uh, independent vendor agreements. And mm -hmm. um, an agency said to me, well, you know, we have our agreement with XYZ Agency Management System. I said, have you read it? It might scare you. <laughs> um, and the, uh, that's, a whole other, that's a whole other topic for another mm -hmm. time. But um, they said, well, what other kind of vendor agreements would we have? And I said, well, do you um, have a consultant that works on your computers for you? Do you do payroll? Do you have a rating system software? Mm -hmm. That's just to name a couple. What kind of vendor agreement do you have that says they are responsible for protecting any non-public personal information that they deal with for you? A payroll company, that, that information is your employee information, all right? Um, a a, a third-party consultant that works on your system, guess what? They have passwords to everything. Um, yeah. So you have to have the vendor agreement, and you have to have it in place, and it's required. Um, the security rule, policies and procedures, or the WISP, as we call it, uh, written um, uh, security policies. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just enough to have two or three pages of what you might find online. It's to have the whole process that we covered earlier. All right. Now, what is that, uh, excuse me for interrupting, but what is uh, down the white paper? I, I haven't been in it yet. What, okay, what the, the white paper is a study that I did with a gentleman by the name of Bill Larson. And in that white paper, I think it's about 14 pages long, um, we delve into exactly what insurance company um, agreements say, where they have the hold harmless, where they have the indemnification, where they have the breach of contract, where they have the requirements, if you don't do these things, um, and it kind of outlines in there some the steps that you have to take to be in compliance with Good. what that contract calls for. Let me encourage everybody who's listening to get that. I mean, it doesn't cost anything. You download it, and there it is. Now, one other thing before we quit here, a couple of things. Uh, agency guard, what's that? Oh, well, before we go, go to Agency Guard. Yeah, that was down at the bottom. That's right. Leave this. But go ahead. What is Agency Guard? Okay. Agency Guard is um, it's a product in development right now by agencies online mm -hmm. that will tie together um, any exposures that you have in the event of a breach between what your cyber liability coverage, co cyber liability policy coverage and what's not covered. Oh, that's good. I mean, I knew that's that they good. were, I knew that the team was working on it. I'm only the chairman of the board, but, and I knew that yeah. Val Jordan, our president, has put this thing together, and she's really good at this. And it hasn't been easy, and it isn't easy to, but, uh, boy, I think it's needed. No. I, mean, I, I don't, we don't usually make this a commercial, but, I mean, I, in that, this case, I hope you guys will all stay. And then, here's well, what you're all, what, go ahead. And then, just, just to get an idea of where you might be in your compliance efforts, we have a little simple survey at netgensurvey.com. Take the survey, uh, click submit, you'll get the results right back that says that you're in compliance or not in compliance. And if you're not in compliance, we should probably talk. No, okay. There's so agency, the guard. agency guard. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's for sorry. insurance agencies. It's couples of, like I said, couples of cyber liability policy with uh -huh. the other contractual liability issues in your carrier agreements. And um, according to Val, stay tuned for when it's available. Well, that's great. I'm glad, I'm glad we're doing it. I'm glad we're working with you. And I hope we can fill in a lot of needs for agents. Uh, there's a way you can contact. I, 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 I can't imagine an agent not going ahead and taking that free uh, compliance uh, thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, why not, for gosh sakes? Uh, Judy, well, any, exactly. any, la any last thoughts? Um, just my, my only word of caution is don't assume you're in compliance unless you have somebody that's done some testing or you've done an assessment or just take the survey. It'll help you out and, and at least point you in a direction where you need to go. Well, I'm glad and you're... of course, NetGen and I, myself, are ready and willing to help.
I know you are, and I'm really glad that we can uh, uh, announce it. I feel like we're really doing a wonderful thing for the agencies, uh, our members, and others. Not even agencies, online agencies can get this, and it's just great. So I'm glad, and I appreciate what you've done, Judy. And you know we'll be in touch, and we'll we'll come back on it a little bit later. Not today, but I mean in, in the future, kind of bring people up to date. So once again, hang in there, Judy. Don't stop. Okay? I won't, George. Thanks for the opportunity of... Uh, presenting some of this information to agents out there. Uh, it's my pleasure, and I'll see the rest of you next Monday morning.